Mention the Bay Area of California, and most of us think about a few things. Tech companies, cable cars, maybe a time when you visited, drove up to the Napa Valley, and pretended you understood when someone said the Cabernet had notes of black currant and tar. What most people don't think about is curling. But in the shadow of the Oakland Coliseum, curling is happening. In a brand new facility, the home of a club that is not only delivering a great sport experience, but working hard to weave itself into the fabric of the community around it. It wasn't an easy journey to navigate, from playing on skating ice at odd hours to opening five sheets of dedicated curling ice with a global pandemic and some construction nightmares tossed in for good measure. But navigate it they did, and they're not only currently winning over the people of Northern California, they're getting ready to make things official with a grand opening at their bond spiel in September. This is their story. California, it's Kate Garfinkel and Adriana Camarena of the San Francisco Bay Area Curling Club. Kate, Adriana, welcome to the whole spiel. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> to have both of you here. Um, and, you know, look, I, I think a lot of us in curling have followed the journey towards uh, curling specific ice out in San Francisco. And it's it's been a bit of a journey. And You've had a fairly robust club on skating ice, and we would see represent, representatives at national events. And of course, the Bay Area is an exciting place, right? It's a it's a play, it's a major market in the U.S. So, like a lot of people in curling, have always followed. But but you're playing on real curling ice now. You have the requisite people coming to curling events in crazy pants, and uh, you know you have. Uh, Uh, A lot of things going on, but what's it been like since your ice was installed and you started to have curling in your new facility? Um, Kate, do you want to answer or or go go for it? We can both jump in. Yeah, you can both jump in. I will throw it to everybody who's listening. Kate Garfinkel is the president of the club and uh, Adriana is uh, is a board member and the head of the diversity, equity and inclusion efforts as well at the club. So go ahead, Adriana, you tackle that first question. What is what's it been like? Um, I think the correct answer is uh, pure madness. <laughs> right. That's what I expected. Um, yes, uh, we're learning quick. It's a, It's been a journey to move, to have our facility. And then suddenly we had our facility. We installed the ice. Uh, we finished installing on a Sunday, March 6th. And by uh, Monday, uh, we had our our first corporate events, so it was we hit the the ice running. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And so now what we're trying to figure out is that suddenly uh, a handful of core volunteers are managing a dedicated ice facility, and we knew that was going to happen, but it's still um, it's still so Calum. impactful that I dream about it. <laughs> right, and. <laughs> And Kate, tell me, uh, you know, uh, you started kind of a corporate event as soon as your ice goes in. Um, you're the club president. So what have the numbers been like membership wise, corporate event wise? What's what's it been like? And I know you've you know, you're all volunteers there right now. So it's a lot to take on. But what's it what's it been like so far? Yeah, it's been um, pretty amazing. Actually, when we opened our doors, we had around 60 members and we're right at about 170 now. Um, so that was at the beginning of March, um, which is amazing. We have so many new people. It's been it's been really great. Um, I don't have the numbers of our Learn to Curls. We've had over a thousand people in um, since the beginning of March. We've been having at least one, sometimes two Learn to Curls every week, and they've been full. Um, so we have Learn to Curls on our calendar all through the summer, and they're starting to fill up. And our corporate events, we have multiple corporate events every week, and we continue to get requests for them. 
So, so it's been really exciting. So you're running lean, but you're busy, right? So that's yes. good. Um, you're not, uh, what, do you think um, the interest in corporate events, sort of what's fueled it? Just the fact that you got some initial buzz about the facility and people are crazy to curl and they want to come out and try it. Um, where or Are you getting referrals from people to try it and then they tell somebody else? Yeah, we are. We're getting lots of referrals. I think also with with COVID dying down a little bit, right. corporations are eager to get out and do some um, community building activities. And some people, many people, at least, you know, at least one or two people are are excited about it. And they're the ones who are spreading the word and getting their their organizations or their corporations to come out. And um, so that's just been amazing. Well, I think one of the most exciting things I just heard from you is you've gone from 60 to 170 members because I think in a market like yours, that's the toughest thing to crack at times, isn't it? Where you're in a market where people aren't familiar with curling and you're trying to convert them from that one-time bucket list experience to becoming a member. So how do you think, besides just being nice people and welcoming, how have you, how have you managed to do that? Um, so we have had three-week lesson series that we've been offering – since we opened, um, we I think we're in our fifth um, round of three week lesson series since we started, and many of those folks who are coming out for that are then joining. We have a learners league also once a week where we pair um, experienced curlers with newer curlers to come out for league, and I think that that has been really great in helping us get um, grow our membership. Love to hear learners leagues and um, set any anything clubs do. I mean, there's a number of ways to 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 cut that, but you know, I, I'm thrilled uh, as a director of curling development to hear that you're doing that, and I, I I hope all clubs really make an effort to incorporate those. It's a tough sport to come in and just say, okay, now you're going to jump in with people who've played, and it's somewhat intimidating, and then you fall once and you quit. So uh, you know, I love to hear that. Um, Adriana, I've spoken to you about diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts uh, quite a bit. Um, you're in the your your location is in the city of Oakland. Um, what are you doing in particular? What sort of efforts are you making to make sure that communities we may not see typically in curling feel welcome and and are are eager to come out to your facility? Sure, and I think the first thing to mention is that our club just by being in the Bay Area, which is a very demographic, demographically diverse right. area, is already more diverse probably than most curling clubs. And so we're really trying hard to build upon that. Um, and one of the main uh, things that we've done is just acknowledge where we are. Here we are in uh, East Oakland, not only Oakland, but East Oakland. All right. So and tell then, me, tell me what, for people who don't know the Bay Area, tell me what East Oakland, uh, what, 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 what does that mean to somebody? Well, for sports fans, you'll identify it as the Coliseum area where the right. A's play and we used to have the Raiders there and also yep. the Warriors, right? So it's um, it's a, an area that that whole Coliseum area is going to be in development. But right next to the Coliseum, what you have is an industrial zone. It's a traditional industrial zone with industries that have dated back even back a, al almost a century. Um, but right next to it is a working class neighborhood that historically has a, kind of been the great uh, migration from the south to the to the north. Mm -hmm. It became an, a black African-American neighborhood um, and also is part of the exodus from the Native American reservations from the 50s to the 70s. So it has a very diverse population. Probably the high, East Oakland in general has the highest population of Native American um, per capita in California. And California already has a high uh, diversity. Right. Um, and then regardless of um, race or ethnicity, 52% of the people who live right next to our, in our census tract are uh, Hispanic Latinx. So we understand that we are aware and it's a working class neighborhood, right? So we are very well aware that we moved to this neighborhood. It also has um, huge issues that the more poorer neighborhoods uh, deal with in the Bay Area, particularly now, around uh, increased homelessness. Uh, it's an area because it's industrial where people do a lot of illegal dumping. There's a, so there are challenges in the neighborhood, but it's an it's a very um, culturally wealthy neighborhood. And so what uh, I've been doing in particular is that I've been reaching out. We already know that curling is a sport of invitation, right? Right outside the 
Olympic cycle where a lot of us get attracted into learning about curling. A lot of us just get uh, involved because somebody invited us to come in. So it's the same strategy, but just reaching out to local organizations, especially those that work with youth. I've been in contact with the East Oakland Boxing Association. There's an East Oakland City Sports Center right near um, that actually, actually has a lot of senior athletes. And so slowly we're building interest in these groups. There's La Clinica and Fruitvale to start understanding that we're here. And in, with the summer programs, there's, there, there's, there's a buzz of trying to get out here. We've already had our district council member and her staff, Treva Reed, come out to curl. And that also helps a lot. And a lot right. of the industrial neighbors, I'm part of an industrial neighborhood group. Um, that is dealing with a lot of the same issues that we all deal together. But this also creates a buzz of knowing that it's not only about inviting people into curling, but ourselves making an effort to find a sense of belonging in this new neighborhood and the in the Bay Area at large, no? Yeah, and I, I, I love all that. And, and, you know, one of the things I stress to, to clubs, no matter where they are, it's not only important, you, you, you want to try to become part of the fabric of the community, right? And not just a place where you're getting together with other people to curl, right? You want to be, I love that you've invited a politician out to curl. And I, I, I hope more clubs try that no matter where they are. But I also, I'm a big believer in curling, of course, and I think it can be a force for good. And I love the fact that uh, your facility can be that. You've got your mission right on your website. Our mission is to develop recreational and competitive curlers of all ages and abilities and be a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion in our sport. Um, so fully supportive of all that, and I think it's great. And, and you know, I, I think like most Americans, I know the challenges just in the Bay Area when it comes to the cost of living, et cetera. It's not, a, it's not an easy place right now, and, and I think curling can, uh, can maybe bring people together in a way that other things can't. Uh, I agree, and I think the, at the core of that being is still something that curlers already know how to do, and it's to be very welcoming. Right. And to the extent that we live by those values as curlers, to be very inclusive of all people, of all identities, all ages, all abilities, it gets us to a point where um, as we make an exceptional effort to be intentionally invitational to those people underrepresented curling, um, our goal is to grow our membership as we grow our membership to make sure that it looks like our surrounding community. Right. Demographically and in terms of all abilities and all identities. So that's one of the efforts that we're doing in terms of trying to champion BEI in the Bay Area. And we put our values in our ice too with our I was cool ice say, houses. You have, uh, <laughs> I suggest that anyone go take a look at your club. The the ice area looks fantastic. Uh, Cater Adriani, you want to tell me a little bit about the ice install? Because I know we had, we were trying, Sean was at the Worlds, but uh, Dave Stevetag and his crew came out. And uh, who wants to walk me through what that was like for people who don't know Dave Stevetag? He used to be the head of. USA ice technician, USA curling ice technician with Sean Olson, who's now our head ice technician as his assistant. Dave, Dave sort of semi-retired from that, but he came out, Sean hooked him up to come out and help you guys. And, and what was that like? Dave, of course, is from uh, North Dakota. So it's, uh, it's, he's, he's not, uh, it's, let's just say it's worlds apart, right? So how was it? <laughs> I see Kate has put herself on mute. So I guess I'll answer this. <laughs> First of all, I want to say this. I want to say thank you, David. Thank you, Dewey. Thank you, Tom. Oh my goodness, we could not have done it without you. And it's um, when you're installing ice for the first time, and that we had an, an ice crew who, which was knowledgeable. Again, we're not. It's the first time we're running a dedicated ice facility. There's a lot to learn still. And we had a new new plant. And if not for them, who dropped everything? to be on our schedule and come out and help us. We could not have installed this ice, which had, we had a few problems with the settings in that ice plant that we couldn't figure out at the beginning and sure. we didn't want to touch it. And then they figured it out. They figured it out every night. These guys would be like thinking in their hotel room. And finally we got it done in time. And of course, without their expertise, it would have been impossible. But, you know, um, ice making, I, I ended up, um, coordinating that 
the the ice and saw because once again learning curves suddenly i realized that somebody had to be there all the time to coordinate with our experts and our army of volunteers that showed up and um if you know david he's um he's crusty he's, he's a <laughs> He's a grumpy North Dakotan. I I played in seven (laughs) USA curling men's nationals with Dave, and I always loved Dave's ice. But yeah, he's crusty. Yeah, I I, he knows that. So he's he's uh, he's not uh, he's prickly. So yeah. But it was um, it was an opportunity for me specifically. I I'm going to thank him very much because there's a lot of downtime in ice making, as they say, hurry up and wait. And so we hung out a lot. And so here you have somebody, I'll describe myself politically as somebody who is um, left of left, no? <laughs> in the Bay Area, I work on anti-police brutality campaigns. I'm a, a community organizer in the Mission District. And David is a farmer from North Dakota with his values and his traditional Republican point of view. And we had the best conversations. And it it, especially as we're installing Black Lives Matter houses and intersectional rainbow houses. And this is a lonely land. We have a land acknowledgement on our ice and also La Liga Latina de Curling. And he, 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 likes, to, he likes to prod and judge, but he's also um, somebody who, who, if you're interested in engaging, he'll engage with you. And we had amazing conversations, the three of us, uh, Dewey, David, and Tom, and deep issues. <laughs> so some, some hope in this divided country, some hope to that the we contrary, can have conversations. It was a hilarious, at one point, I, I was like, we were talking about biases, and David looked at me, and he just, and he looked at me for a while, he thought thoughtfully, and then turned to me, and he says, I'm biased towards curlers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fair. I, I'm going to say I am as well. So that's pretty funny. And so I think we are all biased towards curlers in this community, and I really believe in that spirit of curling and that spirit of um, in, in, of caring for each other. Yeah. I, I think one of the you know, apart from all the great conversations, I think one of the lessons for clubs on this journey uh, to to curling specific or dedicated ice is to get that install right you know and bring people in who can help you figure out your building and uh kate i know you guys uh your your journey to opening this building was not always smooth sailing um so uh if you look back on it uh, as a club president what are what are a few of the pitfalls that you guys had that you'd suggest to others to try to avoid um, that is a tough question. Um, I haven't quite been around, so I am the president. I'll put myself on mute now. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm only the president as of March. So right. I haven't, um, and my, my husband and I actually moved to Illinois for two years while oh, okay. this all was going on and then came back. So that's, so there's the key, avoid the difficult parts <laughs> and then come Perhaps, back. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, this has been a very long project. We started in 2018 um, and just opened this past March. I think that, you know, try not to open a club during a pandemic. I think it's an excellent excellent (laughs) um, point. I think that a lot of the pitfalls we had, um, you know, I'm not sure that they could have been um, that we could have gotten around them. I mean, you know, yeah. they were just kind of unpredictable things that we. Just, yeah, just to be clear, I'm not looking yeah. to assign blame here on yeah. anything. I just know it was hard. I mean, yeah, I, it was I, really was, hard. I mean, you guys were, and and I give everybody their full credit for fighting through that because there were times when you could have just said, you know what, this is too much. We're not going to yeah. do it. Yeah, and there were many times where we got together as a board, or those who were here, um, not me, got together as a board and had to make those really hard decisions about whether to keep going or not to keep going. Um, over this past summer, last last summer, um, was one of those situations for us. And I was on the board then, but not the president, where we had to, um, we needed new contractors. Um, we were kind of, we were at a standstill. Right. And um, Adriana and I worked together um, really hard to, we made our videos um, and try to get some um, publicity around the situation that we were in. And um, amazingly enough, we were able to get the support that we needed to be able to get to where we are today. 
So that has been, um, that has just been amazing. I mean, it's still hard to believe that we've actually opened and we actually have this facility. So, so, so looking ahead, um, obviously you, you, you want to be on financially sound footing and I know, you know, like anybody opening this you're you know, there's things you have to overcome on that front, but what do you think it will take to really like num- membership wise, corporate event wise? I mean, I, I guess you could probably, you're, you're hoping to get it to at least four or 500 members, I guess. Right. Our goal is to, is to four or 500 members, but we do have a financial plan. Mm -hmm. Um, really, I think it goes out for the next seven years, um, that, that has how we need to be growing every year. So, um, our goal at the end of this calendar year, um, is I think around 216 members. And so we do plan to get up to, up to 500 members, but maybe not for another five or six years. Um, Although that's in our plan, maybe we'll grow faster than that if we continue at the rate that we're growing right now, which would be amazing. Um, If you extrapolated out your rate so far, you'd be mm -hmm. there pretty quickly, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we have a pretty detailed financial plan and we are quarterly checking back to see how we're doing um, with that plan. Well, you know, that's great. Any, anything you're doing that maybe uh, other clubs might be interested. I mean, you're in a market, you know, where people don't know much about the sport. Uh, they come out for the first time. It may be the first time they're on curling ice. Is there any approach you're taking to say learn to curls that might be something other clubs can draw on? How, how long are your learn to curls, for instance? Um, our learn to curls are 90 minutes. Okay. And we do about 20 or 30 minutes of instruction. And our goal really is to get everyone to, to play as many ends as possible. Usually Fantastic. about, usually two ends. Yeah. <laughs> um, is what we can get just so that everyone has an opportunity to really get a sense of what the game could be like. I love the idea. I mean, so many times at Learn to Curls, you you know, unfortunately we can, because, and honestly it comes from a good place, but a lot of us love curling and we end up torturing these people with, with information (laughs) and, and, and instruction. So I'm a big believer, get them playing. You can continue to instruct while they're playing. Uh, one thing I throw to you, if, if you want to get more ends in, try ends, try playing just four stones per team. Each person throws mm-hmm. one because they only score usually one per end, right? There's like one and, right. and, and each end is like its own game and people get excited because they think they've won something. So I, I sometimes <laughs> try four stones per, per team and then they get four emotional highs, I guess you might say. But uh, that's great Thank to you. hear. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh we've talked a lot here about the area and everything else. Do you see, uh, I, I know you have a number of people too have, you know, competitive curling designs and Adriana, I think you're, 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 uh, how did, how did you find your way to the game in the first place? And, and what sort of goals and aspirations do you think members have? Um, I think, um, I'm a, a traditional curling story. I saw it on the Olympics and tried it out and I got the bug and stayed. In, and in from, San Francisco, though, in right? San Francisco, in Oakland, yeah. actually, because the club was renting ice uh, from a ice rink in okay. Oakland already. Yeah. And so um, I stayed and then I was mostly a recreational curler who had been joking for several years that I was part of the Mexico curling team. And then suddenly I was in 2019. Because suddenly there was a Mexico <laughs> curling federation. Exactly. And so off I went to Worlds and that was an complete eye-opener for me <laughs> Not, like it was just shocking I, I still realized like what was I doing but anyways um I'm still playing for Mexico uh more knowledgeably and our our it, inadvertently our club has become an incubator for world curling because in our club is also Jesus Barajas who has played for Mexico uh Kate's partner <laughs> and also um we have Raju and a new member who are starting to play for India. And we have uh, the potential to support a Filipinas curling team. Uh, we have members from Puerto Rico and other, other countries who, who want to join world curling. So the, there is a, a, a world curling competitive crew who wants to get better, like myself. But we have members, especially those five and under, who are really hungry to get better. And so one of the things that we've been talking about lately, um, besides, uh, it, it's, <laughs> I, I think I drive our schedulers crazy with like, we need practice ice, right? 
And that we have it right now, unlike other clubs who might have bigger membership. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is establish two types of practice ice. We have where it's in the works right now, mm -hmm. but one which is guided practice ice for novices, which who often ask for it. And that's another way that to keep them in the game. And the better the, you play, the funner, the, yeah. the better time you have, no? Yeah, exactly. And then the other one for competitive players, um, some of us who have had coaching, we know what we need to be practicing. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. our teammates might be uh, in different parts of the country, but you can still, if you practice with other competitive players, then you can start honing in those systems and processes that you need as a team, even if you're far away, because you support each other and look at your form and it's easy, it's necessary. And it's uh, the our big limitation around anything we do at the club, and this will be true for any club, especially one that's just open doors, is that we do need, however, to grow our ice crew because, um, and that's today we're even having a, a training from our uh, head ice tech, Jim Muyo. And if, even if people don't stay in the ice crew, just knowing what it takes to maintain our ice is crucial. And the right. more we understand that, the more support we can get, that activities are limited by the capacity of our ice crew to maintain the ice and prepare the ice. Um, so that's one limitation, um, one challenge, I would say, you know, that we're working on right now. Um, I, I look forward to when you're so successful, you have a paid ice technician, right? So, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what right. I look forward to. And until then, we're an all-volunteer organization, right? I understand. Right? <laughs> I understand. I'm looking ahead, though. I got that seven-year plan in my head, and I'm thinking it's going to be paid ice tech, and you guys can actually just enjoy curling a little more. So, But, yeah, I, I think, you know, the other thing I love that you brought up was that you were reaching out to other local sports organizations. Um, you know, you talked about all the international teams, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that to get um, youth into curling, it's a, one good place to go is, is kids are already playing other sports, right? Yep. Because they may find that, you know, they may play high school basketball and then realize that they're not going to play, they're not good enough maybe for college basketball, but boy, this curling looks like it might be good. So um, I'm a big believer that we can mine those areas uh, where you have kids who are already interested in sports, any any sport, whether it's soccer, basketball, softball, you know, whatever. Um, I think that's great that you're doing that. Boxing, for instance, yeah. I don't. I, I'm a little terrified to play against these boxers, maybe, but uh, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> no boxing, and for sure, um, there's a swimming pool at the East Oakland Sports Center that I was over there on a kind of like a community fair and all the kids were so excited to try curling. And right. so it's just a question of finding the time, the staffs of these, uh, of these organizations running summer camps. Uh, we also have the Oakland roots, which is a soccer team that I've mm. been reaching out to. And one of the things I'm also very excited about is that that Coliseum area. Um, I know it's in trouble with the, it, not in trouble, but it's in, in conversations with the A's about what they're going to do. Right. But the half of it has already been, um, there's a contract with the East, um, with the African-American Sports and Entertainment Group that's going to mm -hmm. develop the area. There is not a development plan yet. It's in the works. But the idea is to bring more sports into that area. And my, it might not be, it might be a women's basketball team. It, it will be supportive of the Oakland Roots. It's, it's, so, there, so I see us in that camp of new sports in that area of Oakland Coliseum that could support the local communities too. And that's why, although my, a lot of my club members don't like it, I keep on telling them that we're the Oakland Coliseum. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that actually. Um, Thank you, Dean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we'll let Ad Adriana close with that. But Kate, any final thoughts before, uh, before I let both of you go? Um, uh, any final thoughts about the director for the club or just, um, you know, encouragement for clubs who are trying to take this step. I mean, you talked about opening during COVID Pittsburgh is another club that opened mm -hmm. right as COVID started. So, um, you, you could probably both commiserate, but, um, yeah. any, any final thoughts on, on, uh, you know, how crazy do you have to be? What does it take? <laughs> well, I've actually been to the Pittsburgh club and it is a great club. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you have to have a lot of people who really want it and who really are willing to volunteer and are willing to come out and do the work um, because that it's, it's really hard. Um, I don't, I did not realize um, I should have exactly how much work all of this was going to be. Um, and I love it. And I'm so glad to be open. 
Um, but man, (laughs) it's, it's a lot. Um, I'm very excited though. We have our very first bond spiel planned for the end of September, September 23rd to 25th. And we're going to be having our grand opening ceremony, um, that weekend also on that Saturday. So, um, you know, that's the next thing, the next big thing that we're all working on. And we're really excited to have folks. It's been great reading people's emails and messages, talking about how excited they are to come out um, and see our new facility. And so that has been really exciting. All right, curlers, mark your calendars, September 23 to 25. Uh, Curl in in, in Oakland at the Bay Area Club, uh, their first spiel, grand opening. I mean, that seems like a, a great package. So uh, Adriana, Kate, thanks so much for your time. And on behalf of curling, thanks so much for sticking with it, uh, quite frankly, when a lot of people may not have. So thank you and, and enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope you're maybe you're off to the curling club today. I don't I mean, you guys are a year round facility. So yes, we're off soon. And it's uh, going to be in the 90s in Oakland today. So it'd be nice to be in that house. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys. Thanks very much. That was Kate Garfinkel and Adriana Camarena on the whole spiel. Quite a journey that club has been on to get to where they are today. And if you're looking for a spiel in September, consider theirs. that runs from September 23rd through the 25th. I'm sure it's going to be great. I'm Dean Gemmel, Director of Curling Development at USA Curling, and I hope you'll reach out to me with suggestions for future episodes or to share ideas that can help grow our game. Email me at dean.gemmel at usacurling.org. And remember to visit the USA Curling website to find news, get results, watch web streams, or check out some of the latest USA Curling merchandise and apparel. Be a member, be a supporter, be a fan, but stay involved in the sport you love.